In this video, we're going to prove that the Ford Fulkerson algorithm for finding a maximum flow is correct. To understand how the proof works, let's go back to the famous application of flow networks, the RAND Corporation study of rail network capacity in the Soviet Union. Their concern, remember, was a potential invasion of Western Europe by the Soviet Union via East Germany. And to carry out such an invasion, the Soviet Union would need to transport oil from its refineries in the east and the southeast. Now, this diagram from the Rand Corporation has a dotted line down the middle, which they're labelling as the bottleneck. This line defines the map in two. It separates East Germany from the oil refineries in the east. And so every train load of oil has to cross this blue dotted line at some point. It could cross it on any one of these links, the links that go from one side to the other, but it has to cross one of them. Therefore, if we add up the capacities of all of these dunk blue edges, which in this case comes to 163 trains per day, it gives us an upper bound on the total amount of oil that can be shipped to East Germany. We could, of course, do the same exercise for any line that separates East Germany from the refineries in the east. If we drew our separating line here further west, we get an upper bound of 228 trainloads per day. And this separating line here further east gives us an upper bound of 276 trainloads per day. The Rand Corporation considered all possible separating lines and the one that gave them the lowest upper bound was this one in the middle, which is why they call it the bottleneck. This idea of a separating line that divides the source from the sink is the big idea in this video. Let's spell it out formally. Here's a simple flow network. To keep things simple, we'll look at a network with just one source and one sink like we did in the last video. And here's a definition. Pause the video, read it to yourself and then copy it out. On this picture I've drawn a line to depict the cut, but the definition writes it out in terms of sets of vertices. The set definition is easier to work with, but they're basically the same thing. The line is just a line that crosses all the edges between S and S bar. OK, quiz. What's the capacity of this cut? Pause the video and write down your answer. If you said 20, try again. Let's rearrange our vertices so that the set S is on the left and the set S bar is on the right. If we read the definition closely, we see that we're only meant to add up the capacities of edges that go from left to right. So the capacity of this cut is 12 plus 4, which is 16. We ignore the edge that goes right to left. OK, now for the theorem that formalises what the Rand Corporation was doing with their bottleneck cut. This is known as the max flow min cut theorem. Pause the video, read it to yourself. Before we go on to talk about the proof, I just want to say a bit about how we use theorems of this general type. Let's imagine that we have two researchers, one of them chugging away inventing cuts, the other of them sitting on a nearby desk chugging away inventing flows. And let's spot the capacities of each of these cuts and the values of each of the flows on a chart. Um, the x-axis on this chart doesn't mean anything, it's just there for visual separation. It's only the y-axis that matters. The theorem says that for any flow and for any cut, the value of the flow is below or equal to the capacity of the cut. Now, suppose I draw an envelope of the capacity of every possible cut and another envelope showing the value of every possible flow. The theorem tells us that the cut capacity envelope has got to be above or equal to the flow value envelope. Now, what if I could find a flow, call it F star, and a matching cut, call it S star, 
where the value of f star is equal to the capacity of s star. That would tell us that the two envelopes touch, and therefore that f star must be a maximum flow. There can't possibly be any flow with a higher flow value, because that would stray into the cut capacity envelope. Or, to say the same thing more formally, the theorem implies that every possible flow value is less than or equal to the capacity of the S-star cut that we found. Therefore, every possible flow value is less than or equal to the value of F-star. Therefore, F-star is a maximum flow. I like to think of the cut S-star as a certificate. If I just told someone F-star and claimed it's a maximum flow, they might not believe me. But if I tell someone F star and I also tell them S star, then they can verify right away that F star has to be a maximum. And that is exactly how we are going to prove that the ford fulkerson algorithm is correct. We're going to pull out a cut, namely the set of vertices that the bandit search was able to reach. And we're going to say that this cut acts as a certificate that the final flow that the algorithm produces is a maximum flow. OK, so we have two theorems that need to be proved. Let's start with the max flow min cut theorem. This theorem's a little bit slippery. On one hand, the result seems kind of obvious, or at least I hope it seemed obvious when we were talking about the Rand Corporation and a potential Soviet invasion. Of course, every unit of flow has to go across the cut, so of course the flow value is below or equal to cut capacity. But when we try and justify it with even a bit more rigour than just waving our hands around, it starts getting tricky. So let me illustrate with an example. Here's a sketch of a network with the source little s in the set big S on the left and the sink t in the set s bar on the right. And I've drawn some edges across the cut and I've also drawn in the other vertices in the set s and the flows between them. Let's see if we can argue for this simple example why the flow value must be less than or equal to cut capacity. First, I've labelled the flow values on the edges we're interested in. Now, let's consider the vertices inside S, the two intermediate vertices excluding the source. We've said that this is a flow, therefore flow conservation is satisfied and if I write down the flow conservation equation for those two vertices, this is what I get. Now, I'm just going to add those two equations together. The C term cancels out, and what we're left with can be written like this. This equation says that the net amount of flow out of these shaded vertices, in other words, the net amount going towards S bar, minus the net amount coming in from the source is equal to zero. In other words, what we've got here is an equation that relates the net flow leaving the source, A minus B, to the net flow crossing the cut, D plus E minus F. Now, let's use this equation to talk about flow value. The flow value is defined to be the net flow out of the source, which in this diagram is A minus B, and the equation we just produced tells us that this is exactly equal to the net flow crossing the cut from S to S bar. And the net flow crossing the cut is certainly less than or equal to cut capacity. Great, so that's the general spirit of the proof. I'm going to write it out now as a formal proof using symbols carefully, and the symbol pushing is all just a way to write out the argument we've made here, but with more polish and slickness. First, to save myself some bother in writing out the equations, I'm going to simplify the notation. I'm going to say that flow is equal to zero and capacity is equal to zero for all pairs of vertices where there's no edge between them. This simply lets me write, for example, sum over all vertices rather than sum over all neighbors of a given vertex. So it's just a way to save a bit of writing. OK, now we can get started. The theorem makes a claim about flow value. Let's start by writing out a definition. 
the flow value is the net flow out of S, the sum of all outgoing flows from S minus the sum of all incoming flows. And because of this handy notation, we can just write both terms as a plane sum over all vertices U. Next, this is where we use flow conservation. This term in square brackets is equal to zero for every vertex other than the source in the sink. That's just the literal definition of flow conservation. So if I add up a copy of this term in square brackets for every vertex in the set big S, the only vertex that counts is the source vertex, V equals little s. So that's why it's equal to the pre preceding line. Next, I'm just expanding the sum. I'm writing the sum over all vertices u in two parts. This is the sum over all vertices u in big S plus the sum over vertices u in S bar. Next step is where we get to cancel out all the internal flows. What I've done here is I've, I've relabeled the terms in two of the sums. The sum variable is just a dummy variable. It doesn't matter what we call it. It's like a for loop. If I write for i in range of 10 and you write for j in range of 10, then our code is just the same. We've simply used different letters for our dummy variables. It's exactly the same here. It doesn't matter what I call the variables that I'm summing over. And the point of this relabeling is to make it clear that two of the terms in my sum are exactly the same, a sum over A and B in S of the flow A to B. And so therefore these two sums cancel each other out. This is exactly the sort of cancelling we did in our simple sketch on the last slide, but we found a way to write out the flow conservation equations so that they work no matter how complicated the uh, graph is inside S. And now we're nearly done. The expression that we've found is less than or equal to the first term because the second term is above or equal to zero, seeing as flows have to be above or equal to zero on each edge. And similarly, the flow on each edge is less than or equal to capacity, which gives us this inequality. And hey presto, we're left with the definition of cut capacity, QED. We've proved our theorem. And now, all we'll need to do is delve into these two inequalities a little bit more deeply, and that will give us a proof that the algorithm is correct. Let me explain what I mean. Let's suppose, as usual, that we have a cut S comma S bar. And let's suppose that we have some flow such that there's zero flow going from right to left. Then this first inequality will actually be an equality because that second term is just the total flow from right to left. And let's also suppose that for our flow on all the left right edges, the flow is equal to the edge capacity. Then the second inequality will also be an equality. And then if both these inequalities are actually equalities, then the algebra proves that the flow value is in fact equal to the cut capacity. Let's just repeat that. What we said is, if we manage to produce a flow F and a cut set S S bar, such that the flow on all edges from S to S bar is equal to capacity, and the flow on all edges from S bar to S is equal to zero, then we know that the value of our flow is equal to the capacity of our cut. And then, as we reasoned before, our cut acts as a certificate, which proves that our flow is a maximum flow. And that is how we're going to prove that the ford fulkerson algorithm is correct. We'll simply look at the flow it finishes with, and we'll look at the set that it discovered during the final sweep of bandit search, and we'll verify that these two inequalities are tight, and then we're done. Good, so let's write it out. We'd better start by stating the theorem we want to prove and by giving it source code. We want to think about what's happening in the final pass of the algorithm, the pass where it fails to find an augmenting path. Let's remind ourselves how the algorithm works. 
There's the flow that we've found, call it F star. We look at this flow and we produce a residual graph. The residual graph has exactly the same vertices as our flow network, but it has different edges. The rules for edges go like this. If there's an edge in the flow graph, where the flow is less than capacity, then we draw in an edge in the residual graph saying, increase the flow on this edge. And if there's an edge in our flow graph where the flow is positive, let's say f star of u to v is above zero, then we draw in a backwards edge from v to u and give it the label decrease the u to v flow. Now, let's think about what the algorithm has done in its final pass. It built the residual graph and it tried to find a path from the source to the sink, but it couldn't. Let's define S star to be the set of vertices that the bandit search was able to reach. In other words, the set of vertices that are reachable from the source in the residual graph. This gives us a cut. Remember the definition of a cut? To be a valid cut, the source has to be on one side and the sink has to be on the other. Well, in this case, the bandit search couldn't reach the sink, so we've definitely got ourselves a cut. Now, let's think about the flow on the edges between S star and S star bar. Let's suppose the original flow network has an edge from S star to S star bar. The residual graph can't have any edges from S star to S star bar. That's how we define the set S star bar to be unreachable vertices. And therefore the flow on this edge is equal to capacity. What about flows from S star bar to S star? If there were any flow going from S star bar to S star, then the residual graph would have an edge in the opposite direction. But again, it can't, that would contradict the definition of S star. And therefore every flow from S star bar to S star is zero. Let's repeat. The flow on every edge from the left-hand side to the right-hand side is equal to capacity, and the flow on every edge from the right-hand side to the left is zero. What we said about the max flow min cut theorem tells us that this flow is therefore a maximum flow, QED. I think this is a really stunning proof, and I just want to wrap up this video by saying why. Let's just recap the idea. We found two problems which are dual to each other. One problem is produce a flow whose value is as large as possible. And the other problem is find a cut whose capacity is as small as possible. And these two problems are linked because of the max flow min cut theorem. We know that any cut gives a bound on the attainable flows and vice versa. This idea of two problems that are dual to each other where each gives a bound on how well you can solve the other, it turns up in all sorts of surprising places. You may have heard of deep fakes and you may even have implemented them using generative adversarial networks. The idea of an adversarial network is that it's a neural network that's been trained to detect, is this image fake or genuine? It can literally be seen in the same way as a cut constraint. The problem we're trying to solve is come up with an algorithm that can generate images and makes the images in our training set seem plausible. And an adversarial network can, if you interpret it in just the right way, give an upper bound on the plausibility of the images produced by the generator. This has all been terribly hand wavy. The thing is, to say what it is that we're even trying to maximize, we need to use probability theory. And so if you want to know more, you need to pay attention to the Introduction to Probability course this year, and then the data science course next year, and then you will have all the tools you need to understand how deepfake image generation is the same sort of idea as Maxflow MinCut.